Live PD, and her very popular show, Castle, is in its third season. You can watch it Monday nights at 10. Please welcome Stana Kadic. <laughs> You look great, and you smell really great, too, great. I will say. I'm glad. Hey, as a Canadian, yeah. uh, which, which Thanksgiving do you celebrate? Because there's a whole different Thanksgiving up there, isn't there? Yeah, they celebrate uh, ca uh, Canadian Thanksgiving is in October. Weird. Why? <laughs> <laughs> it's just different, so we consider everything different weird. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. But okay. is it like is it like ours? I mean, do you have like turkey? Yeah, the turkey, or? and everybody uh -huh. gathers around, and you all have food together, and everything. It's, it's interesting fun. they yeah. have a turkey. Do you think that was copied from our turkey thing? Oh, really? <laughs> I wonder. I wonder. Native Americans only existed in the U.S. <laughs> right. Exactly. That's what I'm saying. Well, they wouldn't be Native Americans if they were in another country, <laughs> would they? They'd be Native Canadians. So you you do both of them or how do you how do you yeah, work? Yeah, like my Canadian uh, Thanksgiving experience consisted of uh, I was working at the time, so I just twittered a photo with this Canadian hockey helmet and a big thumbs up. That Very was traditional. Yeah, it was awesome. You I know you speak five languages, uh -huh. which is. Very impressive. Yeah. You speak Canadian, uh -huh. you speak American. <laughs> what are the other ones? Inuit. Um, I speak uh, <laughs> Italian, French, and Serbo Croatian, which ends up being like four or five languages on its own. And which is your, your main language? Is English, right? English, yeah, yeah. So, like, you would dream in English, you don't dream in other. It depends. It depends, actually. You know, like, if you're off uh, in another country for a little while, then you'll start dreaming in that language because that's what you're speaking with in people. Really? Yeah. Huh, that's kind of cool. Yeah. And which is the best to use profanity? Do you go, like, do you switch to. Uh, oh, man, the one with the rolling R's, you know? Which one is that? Uh, that's Serbian, Croatian. Oh, yeah, really? Serbian, yeah. Give us one good curse word. I wonder if it'll even get bleeped out. Am I allowed to? I think so. I don't know. I mean, <laughs> let's just see what happens. Go for it. Let's see. <laughs> wow, that must have been bad. What, what did you say? I said I love you, Jimmy Kimmel. Oh, that's amazing. very nice. Well, that's, uh, there's nothing profane about that at all. <laughs> wow, that must have been really, really bad for as much as you're blushing. It's terrible. It's How terrible. did you get the job on Castle? That was your first, like, big thing, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I auditioned about nine times, and then it came down to myself and another girl, and we did a screen test. And it was one of those things where I was traveling back and forth from a place where I was living, which is about an hour, hour and a half away. And I uh, came in and I brought the wrong shirt. I brought this long tunic top. And this sounds really girly, but eventually it'll make sense. Um, <laughs> and I got in, and hair and makeup does their deal and everything. And I'm like, okay, I'll just figure it out when we're in, in the studio. And so I tried to tuck it, try to make it work, and it's not working. And I turn to the makeup lady and I go, hey, you got a pair of scissors? And she's like, yeah, sure, here. And I walk outside, and there's Nathan, who's my co star who plays Richard Castle on the show. Yeah. And he's having a cup of coffee. And I'm like, hey, what are you doing? He's like, oh, nothing much, just getting a cup of coffee. He's like, you want to run lines? I'm like, no, but speaking of lines, can you cut a straight line? And he's like, um, I can't promise anything, but what are we talking about? I go, here's a pair of scissors, here's my shirt, I need you to cut it shorter. And he gave me this fantastic look, and then he just started at it. And he cut my shirt all short and proper so I could tuck it in. Producers came out in the middle of it, and I got the job. Wow. That's good thinking. Turn a man into your tailor and you've got him in the palm of your hand. Yeah, no, I think that they should definitely be together. I think, I think, you know, there's little things that they have to figure out, you know. I mean, Castle was with two women in two marriages and Lord knows how many women. Um, and he, you know, something went wrong there. And I think for Beckett, she needs to know what happened there. And I kind of have a feeling that Castle hasn't come to full terms with those relationships and why they broke up. Um, and, you know, for Beckett, I think Killshot is a part of that progression, but um, she's finally coming to a space where she's, she's ready to dive into something like this and be fully committed to something uh, like a relationship with Castle, um, in spite of the fact that she might never get the answers that she's looking for. Um, 
So I think, you know, those, those were necessary steps and I think that they're just about at the point of, of being together, which I can't wait for. I think they're perfect for each other. I think Beckett enjoys Castle's sense of humor, obviously. Um, he keeps things creative and light and he keeps her out of her head and um, he's inspiring for her because he is almost the, he's the embodiment of this other side of her, which is, you know, this kind of, I think, you know, youthful and um, energetic person that decided to change because of events in her past. But it's all there, it's all in her, you know? And you see it, I see it at least, when the two of them are doing that kind of verbal foreplay when they're figuring out, you know, the, or solving a case together and they jump in on each other's lines and um, feed each other information and they get really high on solving a case together. But that's that excitement that they both share. Um, so those, those are some of the things. And I think also for Beckett, he's a great father. Um, he's a great son. He's a caring man, you know? And I think in the end, it comes down to finding somebody who can be your true friend and who will stand by you no matter what happens out there. And Lord knows Castle's been there for some crazy events in Beckett's life, right? Apartment exploding, sniper shot, things like that. I don't know. <laughs> I'd say he's true blue, but anyway. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, she at the beginning of the series, she was uh, she was portrayed as very by the book, and I think we've been unpeeling all of that as we've gone on in, in years, and she's she's just as like mischievous as as Castle's character is, and it's nice to see pops of that here and there. Um, you know what I'm liking about Beckett, especially this season, and I think anybody can relate to this is no one's perfect, you know, everyone's flawed. And it's, I think, a really kind of modern experience to have heroes that are flawed and they're trying to become their better selves. They might not always make the right decisions. They might not always do everything the best way possible. Um, but that struggle and that attempt and that failure and then that reattempt, that's interesting. And that's why she's interesting to me. And I think that I, I relate to that. I think everybody relates to that. And then on the other hand, you know, she's a strong modern day woman. She's in a position that typically is held by, you know, men. And she's somehow managed to hold on to her sensuality and her femininity in spite of the fact that, you know, she's always playing with the boys. And I think that that's just something that we can do now. Women don't have to look like the boys in order to play with the boys. We can, we can look like we are and we can speak like we are and we can be who we are um, without kind of establishing like a real gruff and uh, dudish kind of nature. Um, so she's interesting like that, and I think she's somebody that I, I also kind of admire and look up to. She has a tremendous amount of integrity. She's very intelligent, and she's adorable as well in the same, same time, you know? Our next guest plays a New York detective trying to figure out her relationship with a smoking hot police consultant while trying to recover from a near-fatal gunshot wound. Take a look. It's a classic symptom of post-traumatic stress disorder. I don't have PTSD. You were shot by a sniper. I think it's fair to say this case is going to bring up issues. Issues you still haven't dealt okay, with. Okay, then fine. I'll deal with them. Right now, I need to figure out how to make this stop. Please welcome Stana Caddy. Pepper Anderson 
and Laura Croft, that Tomb Raider chick, that <laughs> police woman. <laughs> Love her. Oh, my. Uh, so many questions. Okay, but first, we'll start with your family. Okay. So you are... One, one of a of, huge family. Of, There's six what, children six? in total. In, yes. But in seven years? In a seven years? In, like, seven and a half years, yeah. Wow. wow. You're number wow. one. Wow. Firstborn? I'm number one. Number one. Oh, that's yeah. a lot of responsibility. Wow. Yeah. What was that like growing up in your house? With um, everybody asks what that was like. It, it's... Awesome, because yeah. I have maybe all not the... for your mom. Well, no, I know. no, I know. There's a period of time that nobody knows what she looked like not pregnant. Yeah, <laughs> um, but yeah, I mean, we had playmates all the time, and they were right there under the same roof. And we owned a, a furniture business at the time, so we had this really huge warehouse that we just kind of roamed around like little bison, you know, doing <laughs> projects and building castles out of furniture boxes and things like that, and obstacle oh. courses. So it was really nice. It was like a great foundation for a great great imagination. And you guys all got along. We did. I mean, you know, you have your regular spats as little mm -hmm. kids, but um, I'm very protective of them. And I think that they are of me as well. And I really, really love them. And I really am willing to do anything to make their future as big and as bright as possible. Yeah. That's so sweet. Now, were you, is that back when you decided to become an actress? Were you young or did that come later? Yeah, no, I was like uh, four. <laughs> And um, we were in a little pizzeria, a neighborhood pizzeria, and one of our family friends leaned over and asked me, I, I can still remember, you know, because people are so huge when you're little. So I think I was up to like halfway up to her knee. And um, she goes, what do you want to be when you grow up? And I was like, I want to be an actress. <laughs> and I see my dad being like, no, you mean dentist. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so I was little, and I used to grab my siblings in the middle of the morning, like 6 o'clock in the morning before we had to go to school, and force them to do plays with me on our porch. <laughs> you know, I always had a big cast because they're all there. But are, and none of them are actors, are None they? of them are actors, and none of them really need to be actors because they're really just extraordinary individuals in their own right. I mean, I have a brother who rode his bike from Mexico to Canada to uh, Chicago. I'm another one that walked from Mexico to Canada. So they all do really extraordinary adventurous things on their own. They like to travel in difficult ways. Yes. <laughs> yes. You know, you're terrifying me. I have a four-year-old who says, I want to be an actress. And I go, ha-ha, she'll grow out of it. Don't worry, she'll be a doctor. Yeah. No, I'm scared. Yeah, I'm scared. Why? No, why? You scared why? No, it's me. so great. Oh, because it's such an easy life. There's no rejection. No, I know. <laughs> But you know what? You're building, you're building her foundation right now. You're building her sense of personal strength, her values and everything. And that, I think, will carry her through any of those rejections, you know? And especially if she can come home to you when she had a really horrible audition or horrible experience at work. I mean, she's so set for life. I am pretty amazing. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah. So I have, I have a couple quick questions about Castle. I don't. I want to yes. make sure we get them in because your character on the show is very tough. Yeah. Very yeah. smart. Yeah. But um, but you said you didn't want to be because it always happens when women play cops they want to kind of man you up and you said you didn't want to be like a, one of the guys on the show. Yeah. You know. I mean. I think that's kind of like an old way of storytelling where a girl in order to be working in a guy's world had to be one of the guys. She had to dress like a guy. She had to kind of neutralize herself and. I think we're at a stage where women can be sensual, where they can be feminine, and yet they can have their strength with them. They can still hold authority. And so for me, it was really important that she can be visually feminine, that she can be a woman and enjoy her femininity and still be respected as, as an authority in the precinct, you know? Mm -hmm. So that was something that we worked with um, wardrobe on, with makeup on, with hair on, and the producers were really collaborative on that. We have a great uh, uh, lead producer, Andrew Marlowe, who loves women, and so I think he loved letting her shine as a woman in the end, which is nice. That's well, we so love nice. the way you're portrayed. Thank Sana you. Sana Kanik, thank you for coming on the show. You can see Castle Monday night at 10 o'clock on ABC.